All right, everyone, looks like we're at the top of the hour, so we'll get started here. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to talk today about our um, mentoring and induction toolkit, um, which has a new focus on equity and evidence-based practices. Um, before we get started, I just want to make note uh, to everyone that you're all in listen-only mode. Um, so if you want to connect with us, either through a comment or a question, please use the question box, which is in the control panel of GoToWebinar. Um, you'll see it um, toward the bottom of the list. Um, so feel free to just write, type an answer or, sorry, type a question uh, into that question box and uh, do that throughout the webinar and we can answer you as we go along here. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Um, as some of you may already know, we have a wonderful team of former teachers on our crew. Uh, my name is Lisa Lachlan. I'm a principal researcher for AIR and have served as a content expert for the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders for the last 10 years. Um, I taught middle school science and I've been studying teacher induction and professional learning for the last 15 years or so. And my work is based in California, but I spend a lot of time throughout the country as a thought partner to many um, SEAs and districts. Um, so I'm really grateful to uh, be with you today. And I'm delighted to be here with two of my colleagues, uh, Lindsay Hayes, who is based in our office in Washington, DC. Uh, she's been with the GTL Center for six years. In addition to working on GTL's mentoring and induction team, she also leads a project on teacher and leader shortages. And she also works on the CEDAR Center, which is um, a center you may all be familiar with. It's a federally funded technical assistance center that helps to um, support state education agencies, local districts, and educator prep programs to collaborate to improve the prep uh, programs for teachers and leaders that are uh, serving students with disabilities. Lindsay came to AIR from the DC public charter school system where she was a high school special education teacher and coordinator. And relatively new to our team is Amy Culpo, who is also based in our DC office. In addition to her work with the GTL Center, she also works with the CEDAR Center as well as the National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, that center builds on the capacity of state and local education agencies, universities, practitioners, and other stakeholders to support implementation of intensive intervention in the context of their multi-tiered system of support. Amy came to AIR after receiving her master's degree in education policy from Vanderbilt. And prior to that, she was an elementary special education teacher in Pennsylvania. And then behind the scenes, we have Caitlin Lee, who's also been instrumental in getting us set up for this webinar. So for those of you who are new to our work, the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders aims to foster networks of practitioners, researchers, innovators, and experts to build and sustain systems of support for great teachers and leaders across the country. We work to support the 12 regional comprehensive centers that are shown on this slide, as well as the state education agencies in all of the states across the country. Um, we also support a lot of districts in this work that have partnerships with their SEAs and their regional comp centers. And then we also, uh, in some cases, support um, the education prep programs that are associated with these teams. So we welcome all of you to this call and we know that you're instrumental to the work. So we're delighted to have you join us. Today we plan to share with you some of the new resources that we've developed to enhance our toolkit. Uh, these resources were developed to specifically support you in developing comprehensive mentoring and induction programs in high need schools. Um, we'll highlight how this work can address equity, namely equitable access to effective teachers and ideally help your teams meet the requirements of ESSA as well. 
We'll share with you some tools that will illustrate how mentoring and induction can be used as an evidence-based practice to address inequitable access. And we'll highlight one program that's been developed in part by using the mentoring and induction toolkit. So for those of you who um, are looking for resources to um, plant the seed with your school boards or with your legislature about how important this work is, we hope to give you a lot of support in the resources that we share with you today. But before we get started, uh, we want to ask you a little bit about your work. We hope to make this interactive throughout the webinar. Um, so we want to get a sense of where you're at or where your team is at in terms of implementing your mentoring and induction program. So Caitlin is going to pull up this first polling question um, and your screen would have changed. So don't worry, um, that was supposed to happen. <laughs> um, so the quick poll should be in front of you right now. And here's the question. So what is your current level of mentoring and induction implementation? And we have a list of five options there. Um, this is based on Dean Fixon's work. Um, so make your best guess. Uh, we don't have definitions for uh, each one of these, but go ahead and make your best guess as to where you think your, your work falls. And let's take maybe five or 10 more seconds just to make sure we give everybody a chance to answer. All right, so I guess, Caitlin, if you can close the poll, then we can look at the results. And it looks like um, we have kind of a split. Wow, this is interesting. So the first um, exploration and adoption got 33%. Nobody seems to be in program installation. 25% um, of you are in initial implementation and then 33% of you are in full operation, and 8% are in innovation. So that's, we have a nice spread of different levels of implementation. That's good for us to know as we um, talk with you through the rest of this webinar. Um, it's also um, nice to know that I think the toolkit can answer some of the needs that you may have in any one of those levels of implementation. So. Um, so thank you for filling out that poll. That's great information for us to have. So now that we have a sense of where you're at in terms of implementation, let's talk about why this work matters. My guess is that many of you know why this work matters, so it's just an opportunity to give you a research-based version of, you know, that might benefit you in the work that you do. Um, and for those of you that are new to mentoring and induction, or new to thinking about mentoring and induction as it relates to equity, this section will really help build your understanding of why mentoring and induction can be an important strategy to address equitable access. So this slide, of course, we all know educators make a difference, but, um, and we, we all know that, and probably have read a dozen times, that teachers are the most important in-school drivers of student achievement. Um, so we know that when effective teachers work in low-performing schools, simply stated, their students are more likely to learn more material. When students learn more, they graduate high school, they attend college, and they earn higher salaries. So if we want them, or sorry, if we want to lead the bottom 5% of schools or the CSI and TSI schools toward success, we need to staff them with effective teachers. Improving access to a diverse pool of effective educators for disadvantaged students and for students in low performing districts and schools is an essential component and perhaps even a condition for both school improvement and the narrowing of persistent achievement gaps. And we know from the research that mentoring and induction can play a critical role in building the pool of effective educators to improve access and meet this need. 
But we also know from the research that schools with high numbers of students that are living in poverty, students with disabilities, students of color, and English learners are more likely to be served by ineffective, out of field, or inexperienced teachers. And these are the three buckets that are used in ESSA, um, the, the ineffective, out of field, and inexperienced. So given that most low performing schools often have high concentrations of inexperienced teachers, we also need to think about how to make those inexperienced teachers effective. And that's where mentoring and induction really fits in. So we might be aware of the benefits of mentoring and induction programs. Um, it's critical also that we acknowledge that the, these benefits are not seen consistently throughout the field. So mentoring and induction really varies in, from place to place. We know that teacher retention is also much more of a concern in under-resourced schools, which serve more low-income students. So those students not only have access to effective teachers on average, but they have more inexperienced teachers on average than their more advantaged peers. So this at least in part is due to the fact that low income schools often are less likely to have high quality mentoring and, and induction programs for their new teachers. And this is a problem that we must all face and begin to address, ideally with more comprehensive mentoring and induction programs in high need schools. So before we delve into this slide, I just want to say a few words about our evolution as a team on this issue. When we first started this work, we were focused on making sure that states and districts had access to our materials so that they could work in any district or school to create a comprehensive induction program. But when we started to really delve into the issues of equity, we realized that this work needs to be targeted. It's not enough to just let everyone know that the resources are out there and see who takes them up. Because more often than not, it's our successful districts that have the time and the resources to actually assess, or sorry, access our materials and, and play a part in the meetings that we create or the opportunities that we create. So what needs to shift is our thinking around how we offer supports. If we want to really close the achievement gap, we need to be more strategic about how we increase access to these resources and make comprehensive mentoring and induction a reality in schools where it's needed the most. And that often means tackling hard problems, um, reducing administrative burdens in some cases, thinking outside of the box or collaborate and or collaborating across divisions. So this is the tough work, but it's the work that will ultimately get us the results that we, that we want and that we need. So if we focus on mentoring and induction programs, um, in, particularly in low performing schools, specifically, for example, if all of you were to work closely with your school improvement teams to braid the funding that you have from Title I and Title IIA dollars, to support comprehensive support and improvement schools and the targeted support and improvement schools, so the CSI and TSI schools, we can address issues of equitable access for our most disadvantaged students. And that's what this visual is really all about. Um, what we hope you take away from this workshop is that we all can, and I would argue should, expand the way that we think about mentoring and induction as a strategy and recognize its importance in addressing equitable access. So first and foremost, it's, I think it's just important to say that this work of course has, um, has merit in and of itself. Um, but having said that, it also helps, this work also helps us meet the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act. 
which requires that states address disparities where low income and minority students are taught by ineffective, out of field and inexperienced teachers. ESSA further requires that activities, strategies and interventions that are taken by states to address disparities must be evidence-based so that's highlighted here. And in other words, these activity strategies or interventions need to demonstrate a statistically significant effect on improving student outcomes or other relevant outcomes like teacher retention or teacher satisfaction, for example. So knowing that you all need support around ESSA and mentoring and induction, at least that's what, why we think you probably signed into this, our team has really set out to develop resources that provide a rationale for this work and a foundation for prioritizing equitable access and using mentoring and induction as an evidence-based strategy to address equity gaps. So the first important resource that we want to share with you is our evidence-based practices to support equity snapshot which is focused on mentoring and induction. Um, this is now accessible online on our website, um, and we can share a link with you here um, shortly. Um, we developed this brief to support all of you in making informed policy decisions that take into account the evidence base for mentoring and induction to improve supports for and equitable access to great teachers and leaders. In the brief, we describe empirical studies that demonstrate mentoring and induction's effect on educator and student outcomes. Um, and we summarize a rationale for, well, we summarize the research. And in doing so, I think we provide a rationale for education policymakers, state boards, and school boards, and all of you. Um, to support further implementation and testing of high quality mentoring and induction programs for new teachers that are serving low income students and students of color. Um, we know that more research is needed, but what we have now and what we illustrate in this brief, what it suggests or what the research suggests is that intensive and comprehensive mentoring and induction programs are more likely to be associated with positive outcomes than prevailing short-term mentoring and induction programs like buddy mentoring. So we hope you find this uh, brief useful. And if you um, want uh, additional support around this brief, we would be happy to support you if you need to have a conversation with your legislature and need a thought partner to prepare for that conversation. Um, please let us know, we'd be happy happy to lend support in that way. So we think that all of these resources will be useful to you and we'll delve, delve into the toolkit in a moment, um, but we think they'll be useful to you for a number of reasons. So we did this um, review of state ESSA plans. And as you can see, the vast majority of states highlighted mentoring and induction in their state ESSA plans, um, 45 out of the 50. And in some cases, they highlight mentoring and induction as a means for promoting teacher retention. So that's what the purple bar illustrates here. And then in other cases, the plan suggests that there's a commitment to using mentoring and induction as a strategy to promote equitable access to effective teachers. So, um, you know, this is on the minds of a lot of folks, um, probably folks that are on the call right now or um, are closely connected uh, at work to the folks that wrote those plans. So if your state falls into these bars, or even if your state doesn't, my guess is you joined us today because you see the need for more supportive mentoring and induction programs in your schools and as a strategy to address some of these challenges. So we would like to know, so here's our next polling question. Um, where your teams are uh, in terms of thinking about mentoring and induction as a strategy to address equitable access. 
So we have two, two polls here. This is the first one. So is your team considering using ESSA funds for mentoring and induction efforts? And you can choose one of those three options, yes, no, or undecided. And we'll give you another 10 seconds or so to fill that out. All right, so let's look at the results. So it looks like we have 50%, so half of our group saying yes, that you're considering using ESSA funds for mentoring and, and induction, 19% that are saying no, and then 31% that are undecided. Okay, that's good to know, good to get that, that sense. And then let's do the next poll, which is, um, how does your state plan on using, or does your state, sorry, does your state plan on using mentoring and induction to improve equitable access in co uh, comprehensive support and improvement schools um, or, and or in the targeted support and improvement schools? So again, thinking about connecting our Title I efforts with our Title IIA efforts. All right, so let's close that poll and take a look. Oh, so yes, well, this is nice to see. So we have 69% that are saying yes, 6% saying no, and 25% that are undecided. All right, well, um, my hope is that by the end of this webinar, all of you undecided folks will be aiming toward that yes mark. Um, <laughs> So thank you all for, for um, completing that poll. That's great information. Um, and so without further ado, let's talk about the toolkit. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay and she's gonna share with you our updates. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I get the very exciting job of talking about what's new with our toolkit. And the short answer to that question is a whole lot. Um, exactly one year ago today, we launched the first version of our mentoring and induction toolkit, which at that time contained three modules. I am happy to report today that now our mentoring and induction toolkit contains seven modules. I'm going to be previewing those um, over the next few minutes and highlighting some of the wonderful resources that you can find in those modules. Another very exciting thing with the toolkit is that one year ago when we launched, um, we created a web page that had previews of select tools within the toolkit. I'm also happy to report that, that as of today, we are providing all tools within our toolkit, so all anchor presentations, handouts, and team tools are going to be available via our web page. My colleague Amy is going to be taking you on a tour of our web page later on in the webinar, so stay tuned for that. So what we're calling our Mentoring and Induction Toolkit 2.0. The purpose of our toolkit is to provide resources to states that are working in close collaboration with local districts to create high quality mentoring and induction programs that have a positive impact not only for beginning teachers, but also for their students. We approach the development of the Toolkit 2.0 um, from a couple different lenses. One of our goals in um, refreshing our toolkit was to ensure that we have this equity focus, that we are providing strategies to create mentoring and induction programs that support teachers in high need schools, and furthermore, that are supporting beginning teachers to become proficient in the high quality instructional strategies that most benefit students who are in need of high quality instruction. We also wanted to make sure that in these toolkit revisions, we were reflecting on some lessons learned um, from the, the piloting of our original three modules. Um, later on in our webinar today, you will hear from two of our colleagues in Indiana who are on the Talent for Turnaround team who, who worked with us to pilot these materials, and we took into consideration their feedback as we refreshed our modules and as we moved forward with developing additional modules. So what you're going to see within our Toolkit 2.0 today is a dual focus on equity and instruction in keeping with our theme for today. 
at the intersection of equity and instruction is uh, an important um, goal that we need to keep in mind of, of providing high leverage practices for all learners. If we are truly going to have equitable outcomes for all students, then that means providing instructional strategies and practices that benefit all students, including our students in high need schools and our students who are most in need of high quality instructional support, such as students with disabilities, English language learners, and other students with learning difficulties. So a theme that you will see um, carried out throughout our refreshed modules is this focus on not only equity, but also how that interacts with instruction and the need to provide high leverage practices for all learners and helping our beginning teachers to become proficient in those high leverage practices through our mentoring and induction support. So first I'm gonna talk about our refreshed modules. As I mentioned one year ago, we launched modules one, two, and three, which consist of an introduction to the toolkit, which provides a general research base um, and, and some information about the national landscape of mentoring and induction as well as modules two and three, which are around mentor recruitment selection and assignment, as well as mentor professional learning development and assessment. Lisa spoke a little earlier about our evolution as a team around thinking about issues of equity. In our Mentoring and Induction Toolkit 2.0, we really wanted to make sure that we were providing um, resources and strategies to address that evolution of thinking where um, our mentoring and induction support, yes, will support all beginning teachers and their students, but we need to make, um, make certain that we are also providing supports particularly targeted to those high need schools and beginning teachers who may be serving in those high need schools. So I'm going to share one of the examples of ways that we thought about refreshing these modules, um, particularly the ones about mentor um, support and development, to have this focus on equity in high need schools. Many of you will remember from modules one, two, and three, um, we um, connected with our, our friends at the New Teacher Center to um, introduce their high quality mentoring and induction practices. In our refreshed modules, we certainly keep the focus on these high quality mentoring and induction practices, but try to think about program adjustments that we need to be making to address challenges in high need schools. So for instance, um, one of the New Teacher Center high quality mentoring and induction practices is the rigorous selection of mentors based on, on research-based qualities of an effective mentor. We know that in many high needs schools, one of the challenges they may be presented with is an insufficient pool of high quality mentors. So in our modules and in the resources that we provide, we um, suggest program adjustments to help teams implement strategies to develop a pool of mentors, including um, some innovative strategies for how they can cross team, um, transfer leadership skills, and, and, and furthermore, work to, work to pool resources to ensure that all beginning teachers have support. We carry this equity theme throughout our, our first three modules and the additional modules that we developed by both connecting with those new center teacher center practices and thinking about how we need to make adjustments for our challenges in high need schools. So I encourage you to take a look back through those refreshed modules one, two, and three to take a look at how we incorporated an equity focus throughout. I'm also going to talk about our new modules since we last had a webinar together. We have four new modules that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. They are on beginning teacher professional learning and development, the role of the principal in mentoring and induction, mentoring and induction for educators of students with disabilities, and finally, collecting evidence of induction program success. What I'm gonna do over the next few slides is talk a little bit about what's in each of these modules, talk about some of the materials that we provide, the handouts, the tools, and ways that they can help your team implement mentoring and induction programs with an emphasis on equity and evidence-based practices. So the first module I'm going to talk about is module four, which is on beginning teacher professional learning and development. This is another module where we connected very heavily with our friends at the Teacher Center to ensure that we were incorporating um, elements that are in keeping with their um, newly released set of teacher induction program standards, which I believe was released in 2018. 
The new teacher centers teacher induction program standards place an emphasis on beginning teacher professional learning, the creation of beginning teacher learning communities, and strong onboarding for beginning teachers. Another one of their teacher induction program standards emphasizes the importance of instructionally focused formative assessment of beginning teacher practice. So not just establishing mentor programs, but making sure that mentors are equipped to provide high quality feedback on a regular ongoing basis to beginning teachers, that beginning teachers learn and grow and improve in their instructional practice over time. So here you can see an anchor graphic from our module four that shows how these structural elements of beginning teacher professional learning and development, such as onboarding, learning communities, and ongoing professional development opportunities can really help facilitate that observation and feedback cycle where mentors are providing that instructionally focused formative assessment of beginning teacher practice. Within our modules, we provide both handouts and team tools. Handouts provide supplemental information to the anchor presentation, and team tools provide um, resources for, for states, districts, and other stakeholders to come together to make some decisions around um, the particular topic of the module. So for module four, we have a team tool on planning a scope and sequence for beginning teacher professional learning. This um, is specifically intended to take into account local context, so making sure that that beginning teacher professional learning plan is connecting with professional teaching standards that may exist in the district, any instructional frameworks such as Danielson or Morzano or, or any of the others um, that are out there, and making sure um, that the beginning teacher professional learning priorities also are reflected in the instructional priorities of the state or district. Module five is around the role of the principal in mentoring and induction, and specifically the role of the principal in supporting teacher mentoring and induction. We partnered with our, our friends uh, uh, at the Center for School Turnaround on this because of their really excellent um, framework for um, systemic turnaround and improvement, a graphic of which you see here. Um, that, that framework for turnaround um, consists of four domains, um, turnaround leadership, talent development, instructional transformation, and culture shift. And I hope as you're reading those, it, it, it's very evident that the principal um, plays a huge role in all of those areas, both from being the, the turnaround leader in charge and creating a team of teacher leaders to support his or her mission, to developing talent, to making sure that high quality instructional transformation is occurring in each classroom, and also setting the tone for the culture in the school building. We know principals have a huge role in supporting mentoring induction programs at the school level. So module five is really um, focused on making sure that we are developing the capacity of principals to do this. Some of our module five materials um, really are focused in on those evidence-based leadership competencies, specifically turnaround leadership competencies that principals need to have, and specifically as they relate to mentoring and induction programs. So things like being able to develop a cadre of teacher leaders to serve as mentors, being able to develop, again, a scope and sequence for high quality professional learning for beginning teachers, and making sure that the structural elements of the building, such as planning time, scheduling, et cetera, are set up in a way that facilitates success for mentoring and induction programs. We also recognize that in the leadership space, we need to be addressing not only school level concerns, but also district and state level concerns. We have another handout that talks about school district and state level actions that can support turnaround principal leadership um, to build capacity for their school level mentoring and induction. And we have a team tool that really would help a, a, a team um, consisting of school district and even state stakeholders to think about how principals are promoting high quality mentoring and induction practices at the school level. So this is, this is a, a module, I think, that very much addresses a need. What is the role of the principal in mentoring and induction? And I encourage you to check out the resources there. Module six is about mentoring and induction for educators of students with disabilities. 
Um, this is a module I am very excited about as a, a former special educator because it is really honing in again on that intersection of equity and instruction and really them focusing in on what we need all beginning teachers to be able to do with their students includes high leverage practices. So we are very fortunate in the GTL Center that we have been partnering with the Cedar Center, the Council for Exceptional Children and others to develop a suite of resources around high leverage practices. High leverage practices are defined as a set of practices that are fundamental to support student learning and that can be taught, learned and implemented by those entering the profession. So those keywords there, entering the profession, is a great tie-in to mentoring induction and why we need beginning teachers, especially beginning teachers in high-need schools, to be able to implement practices that benefit um, all students and help um, support their learning. I would encourage you to, to learn more about the High Leverage Practices to visit highleveragepractices.org. There are some really great materials there that we linked to within the module that I'm about to speak about related to the high leverage practices. Um, one of the most popular resources is a video series on high leverage practices. They are developed out um, video examples showing real classroom instruction with um, um, support and guidance of how, how these teachers are implementing high leverage practices to benefit students in their classroom. Um, these videos can be beneficial if you are a teacher educator or also anyone who is involved in supporting beginning teachers who are transitioning into the profession. We encourage you to take a look at those video videos and the other resources at highleveragepractices.org. Module six, again, I mentioned they link out to those resources that you can find at highleveragepractices.org, but we also wanted to make sure that we were bringing in a, a lens for um, sustainability and scale up. Um, specifically, sustainability and scale up that involves not only the school level the, and the district level and the state level, but also educator preparation programs who are a very important stakeholder in ensuring a smooth pre service to in service transition for beginning teachers. So within module six, one of our team tools is an instructional practice expectations alignment activity that is intended to bring together stakeholders again from the state, the district, um, schools, as well as educator preparation program, faculty and leaders to think about how um, we are providing support to our beginning teachers across the career continuum to help them grow in their ability to um, serve students with disabilities. Another resource that we have is um, relates to a resource that came from the um, a, a needs assessment that was around induction for beginning teachers of students with disabilities. And we created a high leverage practices supplement to go along with that resource. You can see a screenshot from that here. What this uh, team tool is intended to do is to help teams think through how their induction programs are incorporating high leverage practices in assessment, collaboration, instruction, and social emotional learning. This team, this team tool is intended to help teams think um, through how they are adopting these high leverage practices within to mentoring and induction programs and how they can further push implementation of these high leverage practices to ensure that we are giving all beginning teachers opportunities um, to receive really specific high quality feedback on their teaching practice so that they can grow. Finally, we have module seven which is around collecting evidence of induction program success. This is a module that I think will have utility um, for all the people on this phone call, whether your program or your mentoring induction program is at an ex exploration level, an implementation level, or even an innovation level. Again, one of our goals within the Toolkit 2.0 was to ensure a focus on equity. So it's important that with it, when we are talking about mentoring and induction um, program evaluation and monitoring, not just to make sure that we are getting to our outcomes overall, but that we are specifically honed in on supporting beginning teachers in really high need schools, um, because we know those teachers need a lot of support um, to serve the, the student populations in those schools. 
So the purpose of Module 7, um, Collecting Induction um, Program Success, is to really help teams think through their long-term goals, short-term outcomes, and activities that are going to help them achieve mentoring induction program success and then help them translate that vision, um, the, the data talking about stages of readiness into a plan for program evaluation and monitoring that also takes into account really specifically looking at the issue of whether we are getting to our outcomes, not only overall, but also in high need schools. Our Module 7 materials include some examples of program evaluation data that teams might collect in order to um, get to these outcomes. It also includes examples of theory of change statements that can help guide your program evaluation process. So it's now my pleasure to introduce a few folks that we have worked with for quite a long time who are going to give an example of this toolkit in action. So it is my pleasure to introduce Tenny Helmberger and Frank DeRosa. Um, we first started working with um, Tenny and Frank related to mentoring induction work in June 2017. Tenny Helmberger is the Director of Special Education and Assessment in the Kokomo School Corporation in Indiana. Um, Tenny has really been the one to take up the mantle of instructional leadership related to mentoring and induction, and she really rolled up her sleeves in, in taking a look at these tools that we came out and presented to them and really thinking through how they could adapt this to their local Kokomo context. Frank is the state manager for Indiana for the Great Lakes Comprehensive Center. Frank has been instrumental in this effort because of his eye on the big picture. He is always getting us to think about issues pertaining to sustainability and scale up across the state. So Frank really um, was able to help us think through how we were going to take the good work that was happening in Kokomo around mentoring and induction and talk about how we can scale this out to other districts in Indiana. So Frank and Tenny are going to um, take it away and talk about how the, this mentoring and induction work um, happened in Kokomo in Indiana. Thank you, Lindsay, and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're uh, interested in joining us on our webinar this afternoon. The Talent for Turnaround Leadership Academy came together in December 2016 to help states and districts ensure that our country's best educators are working with students who really need them the most. The Talent for Turnaround Leadership Academy is supported by the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders and the Center on School to Turnaround. It is in its third year, helping member states and districts to link equitable access and school improvement efforts. It is about developing coherent and aligned talent management systems to bring effective educators to students in the lowest performing and highest need schools. Attracting, supporting, retaining. Talent for Turnaround Leadership Academy promises to help states connect their talent management systems and their school improvement systems in accordance with their ESSA plans. The Talent for Turnaround Leadership Academy brought together uh, nine state departments of education and 14 district teams supported by seven comprehensive centers to align each state's equitable access and school improvement efforts. Here are the original nine states. Indiana's team was comprised of educator effectiveness and school improvement leaders from the Indiana Department of Education, central office administrators and principals from the Kokomo School Corporation, and technical assistance consultants and researchers from the Great Lakes Comprehensive Center. The Talent for Turnaround Leadership Academy offered more targeted assistance to the states that decided to focus their attention on building comprehensive mentoring and induction programs in the form of an affinity group. In the affinity group, state teams from Indiana, Georgia, Colorado, Mississippi, and Rhode Island received continuing and additional research, best practices, 
from the great teacher, Center on Great Teachers and Leaders and Center on School Turnaround and their comprehensive centers in a series of in-person and then virtual workshops. In addition, states were paired up to use the Critical Friends Protocol to strengthen their pilot programs and advance their mentoring and induction initiatives in, in more districts. Now it's an honor and a pleasure for me to give the microphone over to Dr. Tenny Helmberger. Well, thank you, Frank, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today and inviting us to um, speak on Kokomo's behalf. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of, of background, um, Kokomo in our district basically is comprised of about 6,000 students. We have uh, 13 schools total. We have one high school. We have seven elementary schools, a Head Start building. We have three middle schools and then one alternative school. Our free and reduced rate is about 72% right now for the district. So um, I'm hopeful that we can, many of you can relate to us. And I noticed based on the, the poll at the very beginning of the webinar that many of you are either full in mentoring and induction right now, or you're thinking about it, or you're just kind of dabbling in it. And so um, I'm glad that I can kind of share this process with you on what we've done and where we've um, come from. Basically, in 2016, um, the 2016-17 school year, as we were reviewing our strategic plan for the district um, as, a, as a district team, you know, we, we noticed a need for uh, a better mentoring plan. In fact, uh, recruitment, induction, mentoring, retention, were all issues and we knew that. So we wanted to try to um, you know, gather some data, determine where we needed to go next. And it just kind of all fell in place. We were contacted by the Indiana Department of Education. Um, the Educator Effectiveness Office wanted to partner with us and um, begin this process. And then T4TLA came on board and it truly has been a team effort since that time. Um, when we looked back at our data, and some of you may be able to relate to this, we had 44, in 2014-15, we had 44 teacher resignations. In 15-16, in our district, we had 48 teacher resignations. And in 2016-17, we had 49 teacher resignations. So the resignations were significant, and each summer, we were kind of banging our heads up against the walls thinking of how we were going to retain these teachers and um, the and what our traditional method of inter, in, induction wasn't quite working. Basically what we did was um, in the summertime we would do a week-long induction and we would have um, all of our brand new teachers, which at the, you know, years ago it would be anywhere between 12, 15, 20 new teachers for the district. And as you can tell with 44, 48, 49 resignations, it was getting pretty, pretty large, pretty large group. And we were really uh, overwhelming them with data, student information system, um, you know, grading and, and curriculum and assessment. We had a lot of things that we were overwhelming them with. Some of it was a lot of the day-to-day -day things. So we, we really wanted to look at what would be the best plan to help, help these new teachers. Um, and based on that data that I'd shared, basic 60% uh, of those reg resignations were first they were teachers within their first three years. So it was the new teachers, obviously, that we were losing. And when we looked even further for the state of Indiana and within, 61% um, of those teachers left the teaching field altogether. So we worked with T4TLA and the toolkit has been tremendous for us because it really helped keep us on track, guide us on um, what to do next, provide professional development to our staff in the district, um, principals, teachers, and then new teachers. We started with a self-assessment, which I recommend that everyone do, and we actually did it several times, um, just to monitor our prog progress. But the self-assessment, it aligned with our strategic plan. We knew, um, really it confirmed what we already knew, where our weaknesses were. 
And with that, we then developed a better induction program. Recruitment was a huge issue, so we developed some ideas for recruitment and then the retention piece with the mentoring um, was the next part. You can see on this slide that we created, along with the Indian Department of Education, a um, mentoring and induction program handbook, which we are gladly sharing with all of you. This was really a labor of love. It, it took a lot of time and a lot of uh, tweaking to meet everyone's needs. And it, we, we gathered feedback from principals, from teachers, from new teachers, um, to determine really what should go into this handbook. And it's just a guide because what our, based on feedback, what our principals and teachers were saying is they needed, they just needed a plan. And with that, we have um, the mentoring log activity. And as Lindsay mentioned earlier, we followed with this, we have the teacher standards and learning progressions that the mentors, when they work directly with their new teacher, they can follow these teacher standards and it gives them kind of a framework for when they go into the classroom, when they're meeting on a regular basis. And within the handbook, it talks about how often they meet and what they what the topic of discussion could be. Now with 13 different schools and different, um, we have international baccalaureate schools, we have, we have integrated arts schools, we have technology schools, we have different themes. Each one is a little different, so we did make it to where the handbook could be adapted to each of those schools when we talk about topics for each month to be discussed among mentors and new teachers. <clears throat> so one of the things also that we found based on our self-assessment was that recruitment was a huge issue. And, um, you know, we, we did the traditional recruitment fairs. We went around to um, all the different universities and we really were coming up empty. So we, we decided to um, partner with our local, local university for multiple reasons, but one of them being uh, to grow your own. We found that many of our teachers uh, that obviously lived in our community wanted to stay in our community. So those new teachers that we were losing were actually not from our community and they were leaving for various reasons, marriage, babies. So the grow your own has seemed to work really well. In fact, we have um, what we have, we've partnered with our area career center in the university and students are now taking dual credits and doing a, it was a one year program. We're actually extending it to a two year program next year where they earn, students will earn dual credit through the university and then it's a good tie for them within the community to stay here and um, have credits already under their belt. The induction program that I spoke of earlier that we do now prior to the start of the week or the start of the school year, I'm sorry. We do still have a week paid induction program and we pay our new teachers for that um, for that entire week. And we also have been able to set aside a day when the teacher meets with their mentor. So they know their mentor ahead of time before the school year even starts, so they make that connection. They'll have an entire day to work together within the building and really get acquainted with their own buildings and um, you know the curriculum within the building. So what we found to be most beneficial is that um, during the, and this was all based on um, questionnaires to new teachers, questionnaires to principals. Again, we gathered lots of feedback from everyone to determine what was most important. And that we found that the first day, the first two days would focus on classroom management. And along with that, and that's just during that week long inter um, induction program. Along with that, we will have our mentors, their main focus of conversation for the very for the first year in the teacher's teacher handbook is focused on classroom management. We use well-managed schools here within our district, so everyone speaks the same language. So the mentor has that common language with the new teacher. And we found that to be very, very beneficial. And then the next year, we'll focus on um, curriculum and assessment. So a lot of the conversations that the mentor will have with the new teacher is focused on that. 
our principals also have newbie meetings, what they, they call newbie meetings within their within their building, their own buildings. We have built in um, professional development time that is within contract hours. And they that focus really is always on curriculum, obviously, but it just gives the mentor um, by focusing on classroom management, it gave the mentor a, a focus for an entire school year. So with that, um, we, we did just work with uh, Indiana Department of Education and we, we went and spoke with four new districts that are in a similar situation as we were and we're helping them to build the new mentoring induction system um, within their own district. So we're excited to see it rolled out throughout Indiana. And the hope is that many new school districts will pick it up, not just those four. And um, But uh, uh, as I mentioned, the toolkit has been um, critical. It has helped guide us through this entire two-year process to get to where we are now with the development of the handbook. So we continue um, this year, uh, obviously we're full implementation in this in this district and we have, oh gosh, this year we have 30, I think we have 35 um, teachers and mentors, new teachers and mentors. So our number did go down. We are finding that this has helped. When, when we asked some of those new teachers that were leaving why they were leaving, besides the obvious, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, wed, uh, getting married, not being from here, um, having children, things like that, those that were, the others felt like they just um, didn't find that connection. So we're hoping that with the mentor, that mentor can help kind of reel them in and keep them in our district for a longer amount of time. And that's that's pretty much pretty much it. Thank you. I just like to add that uh, the Indiana Department of Education has used its experiences with Talent for Turnaround, its partnership with Kokomo, to develop the Indiana Mentoring and Induction Toolbox, briefly described on your screen now, and the Mentoring and Induction Pilot. Uh, they brought together four districts uh, identified because of their high teacher turnover data. And they conducted a full day in-person work workshop, which featured in detail the Kokomo Mentoring and Deduction uh, Handbook and, uh, and program. That all took place last September, and now they are engaged in a full year guided implementation of the Mentoring and Deduction Toolbox. The toolbox was developed by the Indiana Department of Education uh, Educator Effectiveness staff through their participation in Talent for Turnaround. While the toolbox is currently only available to cohort members, the department plans to offer the districts across the state uh, in the coming summer. All right. I would like to thank you, Frank and Tenny, for sharing about the work in Indiana. It's been a real pleasure to, to get to work with you and, and the rest of the team at the Indiana Department and at the Kokomo Schools. Um, before we move into the question and answer portion for Frank and Tenny, I do want to highlight one additional resource related to Indiana. Um, this is a screenshot of an article that was recently published in The Learning Professional, which is a publication from the organization Learning Forward. It was written by Lynn Holdheide, who is the director of the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders, as well as Lisa, who is on the webinar with us today. And if it, it highlights um, issues uh, around taking beginning teachers from learner ready to becoming expert practitioners. Um, the, the work from Indiana is highlighted there. You can actually see uh, a, a picture of them right here. That's the Indiana team, wave high. And if you are interested in taking a look at that article, please go to the Learning Forward website and you will be able to find it. All right, it's now time for questions and answers with Frank and Tenny. We already have a few coming in through the chat pod and I will help moderate that. So the first question, that I'm going to pose um, to, I, I think Tenny's probably the person who will answer this, is how were schools he held accountable to using the handbook? 
Okay, great question. So we rolled it out to all of the principals prior to the start of the school year and prior to that induction week that we have for the new teachers. Um, principals clearly understood that it was a directive. It was a, um, a district, district directive that this would be um, continuous throughout the entire school year. And once we met with them, they were able to identify, and again, this is all in the handbook, um, they were able to identify who their mentors would be in their buildings. Uh, we didn't do a formal process of applying or any, we did We did talk a little bit about that. We decided that wasn't the best, um, best fit for us. So they knew who their teacher leaders were within their buildings, and some came and expressed interest which was great as well so then we did a formal training with those new with the mentors prior to the induction so that when the new teachers were ready we went ahead and matched them up with the mentors um, when they were able to meet on that thursday for an intense spend an entire day in the building um, you know they had access to that handbook we do have a google team drive where all of our mentors and our new teachers are, they have access to that team drive. So everything, including professional development materials, are all included within that Google team drive. Great, that was an excellent question. Keep keep the questions coming and, and, the, and we will um, get those queued up to answer. The next one is also for Tenny. It really, it's a multi-part question related to the mentoring delivery model. Okay. So. Is the mentoring delivery model used by Kokomo a one-on-one -on -one or a building mentor model? Do you use any other delivery model, for instance, full release? And how did you choose this model? Okay, so our model is actually a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we do have a few coaches in the building that um, have taken on a couple of mentors a couple of new teachers and only because it would be a smaller school or a subject um, like a department that you know at the high school where we can't it's difficult to find someone in that specific um, subject area so it is one-on-one -on -one. we thought about different models and you know we've we've tried different things in the past also before making this a full-fledged uh, mentoring induction program for us and this seemed to meet our needs the best we did do a pilot last year um, with three of our schools that were priority schools. And with that, we were able to really work out the tweaks and that one-to-one -one just seemed to work the best. It, it gave them more time to make that connection. And we, again, based on questions to the teachers who had left, we knew that we needed to make a personal connection. Great. So our next set of questions, and I, I think it, another one for you, I believe, Tenny. <laughs> How did mentors receive professional learning on mentor skill, skills and strategies? Can you talk about what that looked like, for instance, how many yep. hours was it, when did it occur, et cetera? Sure. Yep. And, and again, you know, these are um, our mentors are our te natural teacher leaders within our building. Um, and Basically, what we did was we uh, had them in um, for, it was really only a two-hour session prior to the start of the school year. We went through the mentoring handbook with them, and that was the whole idea behind the mentoring handbook. We wanted a guide so that they had something really easy to follow, because we want this to be somewhat um we want it to be somewhat free for them so that they can have good conversation and uh, and not basically with the um, the mentor logs you know the collaboration log when I, I I talked about the teaching standards and learning progressions it kind of just takes them through each area that the mentor should be working on with with that new teacher the other thing is within each building I mentioned the newbie meetings so the principals are guiding um, a monthly meeting and and so it gives that mentor an opportunity to hear what the principal is saying also and kind of piggyback on that and work through that with the new teacher. Great. Um, Tenny, you are very popular today. Next few <laughs> questions I think are all of you as well. Okay. Um, this one also pertains to mentor training. Do you conduct mentor training annually prior to the beginning of the school year? When does that occur? 
Okay, so the mentor training we actually do quarterly, and it's different topics. It's all within the handbook. So it, what again, what we did was we, um, based on our pilot schools last year, we determined what were the hot topics that were that would occur quarterly, such as um, parent-teacher conferences, uh, grading practices, and um, standardized testing. So we, what we, beginning of the school year, how do you communicate with parents, things like that. So we wanted to make sure that we talked specifically to mentors and train them on um, how to best uh, communicate those to their new teachers. And also what we've found kind of by trial and error is that those mentors are the best ones to present to the other mentors because what we've, what we've discovered is they have so much to share and they're the ones that are out there every day, the boots on the ground that are, that are living this. So they um, oftentimes during our mentoring sessions, our quarterly sessions, they will come up and they will share out and we do plan that ahead. I will ask a couple of them if they'll come up and share what they're doing, what's working well and they do. And it just really helps with collaboration across our district. So we have that consistency. Great, the next question also pertains to mentors, and it is, how were mentors incentivized? Okay, so the mentors, we are able to pay them um, a, a hourly stipend, and it isn't, it's not much, but the very beginning of the school year, we do a six hour, uh, that the day when they're able to spend an entire Thursday, we do allow for six hours, and they basically just fill that out on a timesheet, and it again, it's a stipend. Then um, the quarterly meetings, we do pay for them to come to those because they are after school hours, not during contract hours. Again, it's just a stipend pay um, that they record on a timesheet, and then, um, that is it. So it's really, it's just uh, two, four, six, eight, and then that's about 14 hours a year that they are able to get just a little extra stipend. And they were, they were okay with that. I think a lot of them are, are really just um, incentivized by the fact that they don't have to continue to have new teachers in their building. They really want to keep these teachers. Next question is, what are the time requirements for mentors to meet and work with their teachers? Okay, and that is in the handbook. They are they are meeting on a weekly basis, and um, it really is up to them how much time they meet. And we tr we try to obviously it's it's within contract hours. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, built in um, kind of professional development time. So our teachers get to school quite early, um, and the students haven't haven't arrived yet. And the only mandated professional development that our principals um, have is on a Wednesday. So any of those other days when they're in, the teachers come in a little bit earlier, they um, have that time to meet with their mentor before students arrive. Okay, we're gonna do one final question. Okay. And that is, does the, does the handbook help train and guide administrators as well? I, it, absolutely. It helps the principals understand the program. And again, you know, that's what I used when we when we rolled this out to principals this summer. We went through the handbook to help them understand the the mentor selection, the um, the expectations of a mentor, the expectations of a principal, the expectations of a new teacher, the topics that they would cover. Um, how to pro, how to monitor this entire program because we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing um, as we move along. Wonderful. Well, Tenny, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I think that yes, really helped my pleasure. shed some um, some detail on on what on the good work that's been happening in Kokomo. Um, to anyone who submitted a question about how you get access to the Indiana Handbook that Tenny and Frank have been talking about, here is your answer to that. In the next section, my colleague Amy is going to be taking you through um, a process to talk about how you access the toolkit. In addition to that, she's going to talk about how you can access a TA support request form. If you would like access to the Indiana Handbook that we have been talking about, the way to do that would be to submit a request for it through the TA request support form. And again, Amy is about to show you where you can find that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Amy, who is going to talk about accessing the toolkit. Great, thank you, Lindsay. 
Um, so we're very excited to show you our new and refreshed mentoring and induction toolkit page. Um, this is a screenshot of it, but I'm going to take you around it right now. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, you can access this page from our main GTL toolkit landing page, which is found under the technical assistance tab on the top of each page. Um, we'll make sure to email you out this link or to put it in the chat box um, so you have access to it. Um, and if you have time, we encourage you to check out some of the other toolkits GTL has to offer, which you'll see on this page. We have our teacher leadership toolkit, um, which uh, explores key aspects of teacher leadership initiatives at the national, state, and local levels. We also have our insights on diversifying the educator workforce, um, which identifies and visual, visualizes diversity gaps across the entire educator career continuum. Um, and something else that we're very excited about um, is coming this spring, we will have an educator shortages and special education toolkit. Um, so make sure to be on the lookout for that. Um, but from this page, you can go ahead and click on our mentoring and induction toolkit bar here. And it leads you to our overview page. Um, so you'll see an introduction, an overview of the toolkit, describing the purpose of the toolkit and what each module includes. As Lin Lindsay mentioned, each module has an anchor presentation, handouts, and team tools. Um, and on the right side here, you will see navigation buttons to each of our seven modules. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what one of them looks like. So we'll go to the button for module one. So on each module's page, you will find a summary of what the module offers, a link to download the anchor presentation on PowerPoint, links to the handout, and links to the team tools. At the bottom of the page, you will also see um, rel other related resources from GCL that could be helpful in your mentoring and induction work. Um, for those of you who participated in our webinar last February, you know that not all of the materials were available on the website. Um, as Lin Lindsay mentioned earlier um, during this webinar, all materials are publicly available in PDF format on each module page. Um, so that's something that's new this year that we're very excited about. Um, if you would like to access the files as Word documents, you can click the link at the bottom of each module page that says Request Technical Assistance Support. Um, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Um, but for now, I want to navigate you back to the main Mentoring and Induction Toolkit page um, to show you another resource that you will find helpful when using the toolkit. And that's our Toolkit Quick Guide. You can find this, again, on the Mentoring and Induction homepage. If you scroll down to the overview section, you'll see the link right here. This quick guide provides a list of all the team tools and their descriptions for all seven modules. So it's a helpful and quick way to know what types of tools and activities are included in each module without having to individually click on each tool within each module page. Um, and it's all included in this one document, so it's a great reference. As you'll see here, uh, we have module one. It shows you what the anchor presentation looks like. It lists the three team tools um, and has descriptions for um, what those team tools encompass. And we do that for modules one through seven. So this is a great resource if you're using our toolkit. Okay, and again, you can find that on the main mentoring and induction uh, toolkit homepage under the overview section. So right under that, in support for customizing the toolkit, you'll see this link that says request, sorry, request technical assistance support. Um, that's what Lindsay was just mentioning. Um, we're going to click on that. Um, requests for technical assistance support can be made for one-on-one -on -one consultation with GTL experts to learn about customizing the toolkit for your needs. Um, and it can also be used to request Word versions of the handouts and team tools, as we mentioned. So once you click on the link, you'll see this form. You just need to fill out your information and your request and click the Submit button down here. Once you complete the form, GTL staff will reach out to help your team identify and customize the right resources from the toolkit to achieve your state's mentoring and induction priorities. You can also find a link to request technical assistance support on each module's homepage. Um, so as I showed you before, if you go into each module and scroll down, you'll see the link here too for requesting technical assistance support. So if you have any questions about navigating our new mentoring induction page or about our TA request process, um, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we will get to them um, later during this presentation. Um, and for now, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. All right, thanks, Amy. 
Um, so we, what we want to do next is also get a sense from you what sorts of supports would be beneficial just generally. Um, so we have a couple of uh, new questions for you and Caitlin's going to switch our screens to pop those up. So the first one is what additional GTL mentoring and induction support would be most beneficial to your team? So we have a few options for you. You can select more than one if you'd like. Um, the first is a list of evidence-based practices, second thought partnering, additional modules, or in-person technical assistance. So go ahead and fill that out. Give you a second to think about it. All right, so let's close the poll and see what we have here. Looks like the top one is a list of evidence-based practices. Okay, that's helpful to know. Thought partnering is also pretty high on the list. And then the third in line is in-person technical assistance. Okay, well, thank you for that. And make sure to use that um, request form, or request process that Amy showed. Um, and just let us know what, what you need. It would be helpful to hear from you. Um, so our next poll, um, we want to say a caveat here that we make no promises here, but we want to get a sense of what modules would be the most beneficial for your team in the next year. And we'd like you to select just one of the following. So mentoring for equity specifically, so uh, mentoring new teachers around, um, around equity issues addressing the challenges of rural mentoring and induction, induction and coaching to support new school administrators. So rather than looking at new teacher support, really providing support for uh, new school administrators. Or if there's something else, please write to us in the question box. You can check other and then write your other idea into the question box. I'll give you a couple more seconds to do that. And then let's close the poll. If you still have questions or ideas about the other, feel free to continue to write those into the question box and we'll collect those. Um, but let's look at the results here. It looks like, oh, there's a split. <laughs> okay, so we have 32% for both mentoring for equity and the rural module, and then 37% for the induction and coaching to support new school administrators. So that one is the one that won out, but not by much. So, um, and it looks like no, no one had anything to add in terms of the other categories. So that's helpful to know. Um, we'll just have to um, put our heads together and figure out where, where to go for next steps. But thank you for uh, contributing to that poll. That's really helpful. Okay, so next we have um, just an opportunity for additional questions. Um, I'm looking in my question box and I don't, See additional questions, but Caitlin, are there others that we should try to tackle here? There are a couple are of additional, couple questions. additional questions. Okay. Oh, I see them here. Um, thank you for switching them over. So the title of the guidebook to request. Um, oh, well, the Kokomo, we were talking about the Kokomo handbook. Um, if you would like to have access to that, you can use the request page that Amy showed just a few minutes ago. Um, yeah, and Kokomo uh, School Corporation, or yeah, School Corporation is the name of the um, of Tenney's team that pulled that together. All right, is there a cost for this information? No, that's the best thing about this. <laughs> There's not a cost. Um, as a federally funded technical assistance um, center, we're able to create these materials and give them out um, for free through our website. Um, we have a limited budget, so we can't uh, promise the world, but we would like to. Um, so if, as needed, please fill out that TA request form and we'll do our best to figure out ways that we can support you. 
Um, so all of the materials that are on the website, they're all free and available uh, to all of you. All right, then one more question. Uh, again, accessing the Indiana Mentoring Handbook. Yes, so the Kokomo Handbook, um, again, place your request in the TA form that Amy showed. The link, I think, is there in the chat box as well. I think Caitlin sent that out. So you can go to the toolkit and start using the TA request form there. Um, so that looks like it for questions. Oh, nope, one more. What's included in in-personal technical assistance, in-person technical assistance? Um, that's a good question. You know, it really varies depending on what the need is. Um, occasionally, we will do a presentation to um, a group of stakeholders. It could be, um, in this instance, I mean, ideally, maybe we would, maybe your team would need to bring together uh, leadership teams from um, schools or districts that um, need or have been classified in the continuous support and improvement category. And you want to give them an idea of um, this strategy or multiple strategies maybe that can address their, um, their needs around, say, if it's teacher retention, for example. Um, so you would you may want to bring us in to do a presentation like that. Um, it may be something that's more uh, in depth, like, for instance, we're working in the state of Hawaii right now, uh, supporting them in uh, data driven conversations around how to really uh, target their mentoring and induction program in high need schools. Um, so that's another example. It can really it can really vary. So that's a good question. But I think Angela just um, feel free to use that TA request form and let us know what your situation is and um, we can start a conversation and see if there's a way that we can help. All right. Well, thank you for all of your questions and um, let's move into next steps here. Um, we as a next step, we plan on sending you a follow up email based on your registration for this webinar. And in that, we'll send you a link to the toolkit web page. Um, and again, you can request access to materials if you want, rather than the PDF versions that are on the web page. If you want Word versions that you can customize to your specific context. You can just request that from us and we can send you the Word versions of, of all of these documents. Um, and then we'll also send you a link to the webinar survey. Um, so on the next uh, page, we also have a link here. And um, Caitlin, you may be able to put that into the chat box as well. Oh, there it is. Excellent. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, and again, we we say this all the time, but it's always useful to get your feedback. Um, we'd love to hear uh, whether this webinar really met your needs, whether um, the resources themselves seem to be really relevant to you or not. So that feedback would be very welcome. So um, thanks in advance for doing that. So we'll send you that email. Um, if you would like a copy of this PowerPoint, it looks like we're getting some interest in that. You can also let us know um, that you'd like a copy um, through that request page. Um, and then we can, we can certainly clean this up and send it off to you. Um, the next few slides are reference slides. So we can go through those briefly. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you all. I want to say thank you especially to Frank and Tenny for joining us today and presenting the good work that they're doing in Indiana. It's always valuable to have a practitioner um, join us and make this work real. So thank you, Tenny. Thank you, Frank, for joining us and, and doing that for, for all of us. And then thank you to Lindsay, Amy, and Caitlin um, for being uh, such great team members and for pulling this all together with me. Uh, and then finally, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we hope these resources will benefit you and your teams. Uh, have a wonderful Valentine's Day and let's be in touch.
So thank you. Thank you all. And we'll be in touch. Bye-bye.